This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. You have a fancier name for it than that, I assume. Do you mean for poop? So 250 times people have found poop, put it in a bag, and mailed it to you. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, we learned about how you can get members of the general public to do your research for you. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 111. I'm Joshua Hall. And I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Dan, it's been a month of Sundays. Uh, that's four Sundays, roughly, right? That probably is about how long it's been since we've been in the studio Yeah, that's together. right. It, yeah. It's been a while. Yeah, we, we posted a rerun last week. We yeah. haven't done that for a while. Has everybody done their taxes? I hope so. It kind of inspired me. Not everyone. I have not. I have not either, but I did work on it. <laughs> but inspired My taxes you, are complicated. It inspired you to think about yeah. maybe doing them. Yeah, exactly. I'm, 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 I got a new job this past year, so it's more work than oh, it yeah, has been before. Oh, yeah, that is more work. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to owe money, and so, you know, I remember I used to always get so a if refund. You, if you wait, then they don't well, yeah, take I mean, it. Why would I not wait? You know, when yeah. I used to get a refund, and in grad school, I almost always got a refund, I was chomping at the bit to get my form so I could, like, do it immediately. And First one at the post office? Yeah, now I'm like, well, April 14th, I'll get to it. Yeah. You'll get fine. yours, Uncle Sam. But anyway, we're not here to talk about taxes, but let's talk a little bit about this beer that's in front of us. Okay. This is this is one of my favorite types of beer. Is that true? Listener beer. Listener beer. That's right. <laughs> you were really confused. <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to say sour beer. Yeah. Uh, spoiler alert. Uh, yeah. This one was generously sent to us by a uh, listener and friend of the show, Adrian, who's a grad student at Georgia Tech. And Adrian did not only send one type of beer, but he actually sent us four different types of beer. I smell a series coming. So he, he wrote us a little note. I'm going to read a little bit of this. He said, Hey there, glad the beers made it safely. I was scared they were going to burst. They were, uh, that is always the risk you take, um, mailing beer. It was winter time. They wouldn't get that hot. They would get jostled. That is true. And these are cans. I feel like a can is yeah, a safer thing cans. to ship. Um, you know, that is true. Actually, it was out at UCLA this past week and some listeners sent me home with some beer and it was in cans. So I was actually Googling the night before my flight best ways to transport beer on the plane and it said cans were way safer. Yeah, and you have to check that bag, I assume. I did have to check the bag, yeah. Cracking them open out of your carry-on. <laughs> <laughs> Can't bring these through, sir. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'll finish them here. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, Adrian, back to Adrian. He said three of these beers are from one of his favorite breweries, Creature Comforts Brewing Company, which is in Athens, Georgia. And they have a slogan called Crave Curiosity, which he found to be appropriate, an appropriate sentiment for grad students. It's a very curious looking can. It's kind of a monochromatic cyan print. Uh, it looks like the world has flooded, the entire earth, and there's a mermaid staring at an octopus. And like a sea creature. Is that a... Oh, it's an octopus. That's my assumption. I have no idea. Well, so I met Adrian at a conference back in the fall, and we got into a discussion about um, one of his favorite types of beer, which are sours. Yeah, and you have a stated bias against them. Is it just me? I think most people do. Yeah, I, I I am willing to try. I don't know if most people do, but we do. No, I think a <laughs> lot of people have a bias against a sour beer. But this is our chance. This is his pitch for what a good sour beer tastes he like. He claimed in that moment he had some sour beers that would change our mind. And so... So, so did you say the name one. of this already? This is the Tritonia Ghosts. Uh, so I believe the Tritonia, I did a little bit of research, is one of their flagship beers. And they have a sour version that they release throughout the year with different types of flavoring. So this one that we are drinking is the cucumber, lime, and salt. So I will say I actually really enjoy drinks with cucumber flavoring. That's something I really enjoy. Fully agreed. So I have high hopes, and I like a little salt too. So uh, let's try this. I already sampled it. First thing, cucumber. Second thing, salt. It's all in there. I'm going to go ahead and say this. I'm enjoying this one. Look at that. Thank and, you, Adrian. And I know Adrian thinks I'm probably just blowing smoke. No, you wouldn't do that. I would not do that. I would be completely it's honest with style. Adrian. But I actually like this. This is surprisingly refreshing. It is sour, but it's not, you know, it's not pucker your your mouth. I sour. wonder if it is sour and the salt 
is mm. covering it a little bit. You know how salt sometimes covers other flavors? Oh, and you know what? I like could a, be totally wrong. You know, like a margarita. Exactly. And I like a margarita. Um, I want to tell you a little bit, Dan, about ghost beers, because I don't... Please do, because you... We've well, not had many on the show. Clearly. We didn't discuss this beforehand, and I saw a ghost. I thought, oh, I don't know what that is. We'll try it. Um, I took my first sip, and I, I still didn't realize until you said he sent us sour beers that it was on the sour beer spectrum. I knew mm, it didn't yeah. taste like... You know, the beers that we normally drink, the IPA flavors, but I, I didn't pick up on the fact that it was sour enough to be a sour beer. Tell me about a ghost. Yeah, sure. So so a ghost beer is a top fermenter, and it actually originated in Goslar, Germany. That's where the name comes from. And the salt comes from the fact the Ghost River, which runs through Goslar, is a salty water. So... And this probably explains why there are sea creatures on the can. It just occurred to me. Well, maybe, but it seems like in more modern day, uh, not all brewers are actually brewing with naturally saline waters. And so... Be tough to do. Uh, it's probably... Prob- more modern varieties have added salt. What's the molarity of salt in your uh, Lurie or Batani broth? Probably higher than this, okay. I would say. But I think we might have mentioned this before. Sour beers initially came about through spontaneous fermentation by, I guess you could call it a contamination with bacteria. Yeah, didn't we have this conversation about the... Um, oh, I think we did. Yeah, I think we did. We'll go back into the archive. <laughs> That's true. Lactobacillus. So um, now lactobacillus specifically is used for this type of beer. Um, I'm a microbiologist. I study bacteria. I can get into that. Living the dream. And uh, anybody who's drinking out of the can will actually see lactobacillus name right on the cover. Right on the cover. So anyway, thanks, Adrian. And... I'm going to go so far as to say, mission accomplished, this is the first sour beer I've had that I enjoyed. And I'm going to be in Georgia in a few weeks, so maybe I'll look for some. Thanks again, Adrian. All right, Dan. Also, some additional thank yous are in order. We have two new Patreon patrons. (coughs) Wanted to give a special shout out and thanks to Rubia and M. Thank you so much. And Dan, you know, I just wanted to take a moment. We don't always do this, but I just wanted to make sure we, we took a moment to say a special thanks to all of our patrons. You know, we have some patrons who have actually been supporting the show for quite some time. Since the first time we announced we would try that platform. And I don't even remember how long that's been now. You know, A long time, yeah. Probably a couple of years, maybe. Decades. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that I wanted to mention that we've been able to do, thanks to that generous support, is upgrade our mobile recording studio, uh, which you're actually going to get to enjoy today, Dan. You actually got your chance to take it for a test drive <laughs> on your right. own without me peeling back the the layers a little bit. I'm usually the recording engineer, but I was out of town and you did this interview on your own with our new mobile recording studio. Yeah, it is, and it's really it's really amazing. The sound quality is great. I didn't feel like a very intelligent person when I was first trying to operate it. I was texting Josh saying, "What do the fifty knobs do?" <laughs> um, we got it worked out, and and hopefully you'll hear the quality. So again, thank you to all of our patrons. If you go back listen to some old episodes, which I always cringe if I ever hear some of the old episodes. There was a noticeable drop in audio quality when we were not in our normal studio, but this really enables us to give you a better quality show and talk to a lot of different people who can't make it here into the studio. All fits in a little carrying case. Speaking of support, Dan, I wanted to also tell our listeners about something really special that Promega has coming up. That's right. They're doing a 2019 real-time PCR grant. So if you do real-time PCR in your lab, um, you can apply to receive this $10,000 grant. Is it $10,000? $10,000 in Promega products, access to VIP technical service, and specialized training on real-time PCR techniques. So uh, if this is a technique that you employ in your lab, I highly encourage you to go out and apply for it. You can apply before May 10th at www.promega.com slash real-time grant. You, you did some of this in your lab, didn't you? Uh, you know, I never did a whole lot of real-time PCR. Was that even invented yet when we were... <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Yes, of course <laughs> it was. It yeah. was yeah. So apply for this grant, and then you can justify all of the podcast listening you're doing while you're in the lab. While you're watching your real-time PCR run. It pays off. All right, Finally. Josh. Let's get to our interview. All right, sounds good. So, Josh, as I referenced, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I caught up with Talia Perry at the SITSAI 2019 conference. SITSAI. You know SITSAI, the tw- SITSAI 2019. I'm sure you were there. Yeah, SITSAI. Is that when you uh, prune those little trees? <laughs> That's bonsai. Oh, very close. This yeah. The Citizen Science Conference, and it took place in Raleigh, North Carolina. Talia came from very much farther away than that, and you'll, you'll get to hear a little bit about her. But she is a graduate student 
at the University of Adelaide in Australia. I'm going to let her tell you about her research and why she happened to be attending a citizen science conference. All right. I'm here with Talia Perry. Welcome to Hello PhD. Thank you so much for having me. Talia, you have flown halfway around the world, and we're very excited that you're here because you study a creature that I know almost nothing about. So tell us a little bit about where you're from and, and what you study. Yeah, cool. So I'm from the University of Adelaide. I'm a PhD student, hence Hello PhD, um, uh, which is in South Australia, which is down the bottom of Australia. Not many people really have heard of South Australia or Adelaide, especially at this conference so far. <laughs> yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> so not Sydney, definitely not Sydney. Um, so I... Um, studying a creature that you definitely don't have over here, um, which is the echidna. And echidnas are one of the most fascinating mammals in the world because they are only one of two egg-laying mammals, which makes them super fascinating in all terms of their biology. The, this is a monotreme, right? This yes, monotreme. the name for this group yep. of things. So I had to look up pictures of <laughs> echidnas. Yeah. And for the people listening, please go look it up. We'll put up a picture, but it looks kind of like a hedgehog crossed with an anteater. Yeah. About how big are they? They're about, I don't know how to put this in, in terms. Uh, Three like, apples high is how big Smurfs <laughs> are. So. Uh, like two basketballs. <laughs> oh, they're that big? Yeah, they're, they're, quite, they're quite large, the, especially the, especially the full grown ones. They get okay. quite big, yeah. That makes sense. I saw a few pictures, but there was no, there was no banana for scale, so yeah. I had no idea how big they are. Yeah. Two basketballs? Yeah, they're like... That's huge. That big. For the people that are listening at home, you definitely... <laughs> <laughs> Roughly that big, yeah. That's, that's incredible. And, and they, they've got this long snout. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and tell me about their... I mean, the snout is the least noticeable <laughs> thing about them. They've got these spikes all over their back. Tell me about um, their life. Yeah, well, they, um, they live all over Australia, which is, like, super fascinating. We have very different environments. You go from, like, arid deserts to snow and tropical areas, and they're, they're found everywhere. Um, they have these, yeah, gig that they've got spines all over their back, which are actually just really, really thick hairs. Okay. And they develop the spines first when they're, when they're babies. Um, and then they've got fur or hair sort of intermittently sort of around the spines. Um, and it's really funny if you go sort of south towards Tasmania area, um, you get really, really fluffy echidnas. So I'll send like you, soft? They just, they just look fluffy because their hair is longer than a lot of their spines. I so they see. don't actually, you can't really see many of their spines. And they but just still look like don't big touch them. Mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, they're still, they're still very, very difficult to to grab. <laughs> so what do they eat? Where they, you said they can live anywhere. Yeah, well, when you said anteater, they actually are anteaters. That's what they're sort of known to be mo most famously for. Um, but there has been sort of evidence and people watching them and seeing that they actually eat a whole range of different insects. But we don't know what those insects are yet because you see the ant exoskeletons all throughout the echidna's poop. And so that's how people have sort of, and you, you watch them and they'll sort of go hunting for ant and termite mounds and they've got like the gigantic long sticky tongues like ant eaters and pangolins and those sorts of okay. animals do. Yeah, I was, uh, anybody who's listened to the show long enough knows that I love words and, and word mm -hmm. origins and the genus is, it's tachyglossus. Tach yep, tachyglossus. Which tachy, fast, glosses tongue. Ah. I think that's where that comes from. So it's a fast tongue. It is a fast tongue, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a weird name for an animal. Um, okay, so so they eat ants and other things. And is this part of what you're studying? Yeah, it is. So um, I am studying echidna poop, basically, um, and wanting to find out more about all of their biology from... You have a fancier name for it than that, I assume. Do you mean for poop? Scats, Scat. right? <laughs> <laughs> It's really, yeah, I, I've sort of, I went from using the word scat to people not knowing what that was to just being like, it's poo. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're not singing jazz, no? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you, you collect this and look for evidence of what it is they're consuming, or what are you trying to learn? Well, I am actually from a genetics background, so I'm looking at the DNA and the hormones that are actually found inside of the scats, and so from that you can get the DNA from the food they're eating, because that's all all sure, throughout yeah. it. Um, you can get the DNA from the echidna itself, so we can actually find out more about you know, it, the genetic makeup of the populations around the country, which is also a little bit of a controversy. 
Um, and also their microbiome. So microbiome is obviously a great indication of health. And so that is fascinating. There's yeah. an echidna microbiome project. Yeah, absolutely. That's and, amazing. Yeah, and it's really cool because we've got samples from the captive echidnas too, so we can actually compare between the captive and the wild echidnas, which is super fascinating to find out the differences with that. That's amazing. So are they endangered? Or are they threatened? Is there some reason that they're an interesting population to study? Well, even though they're, they're a really iconic animal in Australia, everyone knows what an echidna is. Now, once you've it? seen one, you will never yeah. unsee it. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're really quite adorable. They're, they are. They're, they're cute little animals. They really are. They're amazing and everyone loves them. Um, but they're really understudied in Australia, mainly just because they're really cryptic and they're really hard to find out in the wild. If you do find one, you might not see the same animal for a couple of years in the same area. Um, or there's, they don't have next so it's really hard to put trackers on them but even if you do put a tracker on them you'll sort of know that they're in like a couple of media meter radius around you and you still can't find it because they're really good at hiding and they just disappear into the soil or they're really good at camouflaging yeah into they the burrow and, and yeah. get into the leaf undergrowth yeah, yeah. they can some if the soil is like loose enough they can literally just sink directly into the ground because their front legs and their back legs, the back legs point backwards, mm -hmm. um, which is also a fascinating story because museums put them forwards um, because oh, they didn't know, right? they they didn't didn't know any better. Yeah. yeah, so all throughout Europe and America especially, they're all flipped around the wrong way, which is really interesting. I never thought of that. That's amazing. <laughs> so next time you go to a museum or you see a stuffed echidna, check for the back legs because that's what I do. Because some, some taxidermist has flipped <laughs> yeah, them the wrong way. Yeah, because I just automatically thought that they, like most animals, their back legs would be pointing forwards because yeah. that's a pretty Why normal you? thing. But no, they sort of They also backwards. lay eggs though, so I feel like yeah. we should not make any assumptions <laughs> about the orientation of echidna. Yeah, exactly. So they, yeah, so they, because of their back legs, pointing backwards and the front legs pointing forwards they sort of just like dig and then they just disappear into the ground it's it's with just spikes showing. yeah <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah sometimes they go all the way under um wow. yeah and other times yeah you see just like sort of some spikes and they breathe through the little nose that sticks yeah, out yeah they okay. use it, they use their nose as a snorkel they, they swim a lot as well so they use their nose as snorkels when they're swimming which is really interesting it, i don't know where we go i'm not with the first person to say it australia <laughs> has the most amazing animals <laughs> I, I would love to I don't know if you have any background in this. I would love to understand how monotremes split off from the tree of mammals. Yeah. Well, did did they, egg laying evolve separately on its own or is there some bird involved somewhere in the past? Well, they're the oldest group of mammals. Okay. So you've got, you know, the, the birds and reptiles splitting off and then the mammals splitting off. Um, and the monotremes are the most ancient form I of see. mammals. And so after So egg laying that, evolved away from... Yeah, mammals yeah. evolved to not lay eggs anymore. Yeah, exactly. So you're sort of seeing a snapshot, snapshot in evolution, essentially, with the monotremes that you've got the egg-laying part of things from the birds and reptiles, but you've also got them providing milk for their young, um, which is the mammal side of things, and having right. fur and all of that. Um, and then after that, you've got the marsupials and the eutherians splitting off from each other, uh, like another 40 million years after that. So where the where the young are kind of born, but not developed enough to live on their own and they're kept yeah, in the pouch. Yeah, yeah. So you see from the monotremes, they've got an egg and they only like, they're only in the egg for like 10 days and then they hatch and they're like the size of your thumbnail. They are wow. so small. Um, and then they develop in the mum's pouch, but they develop really, really quickly within like the first couple of months you see spines and they're about the size of a, a cricket ball, I guess. Um, and then whereas with the marsupials, they're born very very small right. so they're still probably only like an inch big or something um and and then they develop live in, in the their, pouch they yeah. live in the pouch whereas the what most people sort of recognize as mammals which is you know us and and cats and dogs and elephants and horses ele are born able to walk right yeah 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 it's so a much different level of are way more developed as they're born basically awesome well i mean it's wildly fascinating um and you're studying their microbiome and their genetics and their food sources from their poop. Mm -hmm. I'm a little worried for you as a graduate <laughs> student because they sound very elusive. Yes. How are you supposed to graduate by collecting <laughs> this and getting a big enough sample? I mean, you would have to... I can imagine you could hunt all day and never find one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is where this other part of my PhD, which has been really cool to run, um, is the world of citizen science, which is basically where you get the general public to help out with your research. And they do real science um, during the process. And there's different types of citizen science. There's projects where there's a researcher that develops a project and then they have the general public helping out with collecting or analyzing data. But there's also projects where the communities themselves um, co-create the 
projects. They're really involved with the design process and um, actually implementing everything that's going on. So there's a range of different types of citizen science projects. But that's the only way I've been ever ever be able to do my PhD is through citizen science where I'm getting the general public to basically collect a kidna poo for me from across Australia, which has been incredible. So how do, how do people get involved? What is, what is the way that they're um, finding out about it and, and participating? Well, we de developed an app for it so that it was an easy to use thing and people would have it on their mobile phones that everyone has. Could a I get it today? Now. I'm not going to yeah. see the kid. Yeah. So <laughs> you can definitely download yeah. it. It's called, so the project is called Echidna CSI. Uh, so nice. we're meant to be sort of um, melding the echidna and the sort of um, genetic CSI aspect right. of it because, you know, we're looking at very small quantities of DNA like you do in forensics. Um, and the CSI stands for Conservation Science Initiative because we are trying to put this all together for the, the help yep. of the conservation of echidnas in, in general. So I get the app. Yes. And if I'm in Australia where I might actually see an echidna, <laughs> yeah. you don't want reports of porcupines or anything like that? No, okay. that would just be me cleaning up all okay. of that data. <laughs> okay. okay, so somebody in Australia downloads it. What are they supposed to do? So we've got two approaches for the project. So the first one is to just give us photos of echidnas themselves because even though they're well-loved in Australia, we have like basically no knowledge of exactly where they're found. So we want people to take photos of them so that and through the app that will then track the GPS location, the date and time, all of that information instantly through the app. And then we get all of that information across the entire country. Because if you Google a map of echidnas, it's just Australia colored in one solid block of color. Right. Like there is no actual distribution yeah. map for them available yeah. um, because of how hard they are to find in the wild. Um, so we're asking for that as a, as a first point of call. And then the second one is getting people to find echidna poop for me. And again, taking a photo of it um, when they see it so that we get the GPS location. But then also literally just to put it in a plastic bag and to mail it to me. So and I that's get, legal in the mail system? Yeah. Well, no one knows about okay. it. So. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> we have, haven't had any complaints yet. No, no complaints yet. <laughs> so uh, I'm assuming that it's recognizable as echidna poop or you have to watch the echidna do it before you know it's theirs? <laughs> no, the echidna poop is like really distinguishable, okay. which is like... A perfect for a citizen Josh science Josh would be project. very mad if I didn't ask you to describe echidna poop. Yeah. <laughs> so echidna poop looks like, it's they're basically like tubes of soil. Okay. So they're quite thick. Um, I, I use a five cent coin in Australia, but I don't know what the equivalent is okay, in the yeah. US. So like a, a coin a coin size basically, um, and they can be like 10 to 15 centimetres long. So they're really quite large. Again, I don't know what the yeah. conversion is in inches. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they're, they're full of soil because they suck up the soil as they're sucking up the insects. As they're insects. eating insects, yeah. Um, and you see all of the ant exoskeletons through them too. So you saw, it kind of looks like glitter in the lights, okay. um, which is a good way to describe it so that people get interested. But it's, you know, it's kind of like a scat that it doesn't look like anything else in, in the wild, in like either our native wildlife or even feral cats, foxes. Like it doesn't look like anything It's distinctive else. so it's that you know you're not picking up yeah. the neighbor and dog. And also yeah. like it's, it's quite like clean. It's like literally just soil and some ants. So it's, people don't, like care about picking gross, it up yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not it's not, not like gross um yeah. and it was really fascinating starting this project being like oh yeah we'll, we'll ask people to collect it not sure how this would go but man people are really interested in poo <laughs> yeah so how how has it gone have, have you gotten people to sign up have they downloaded the app yeah. are they sending you yep so samples? We've, we've been running samples for, i'm doing so air quotes <laughs> We've been running for uh, a year and a half now, and we've got over 6,000 people that no. have downloaded the app yeah, wow. and have been using it, um, submitting sightings and scats to us. Uh, we had just hit over 5,000 sightings last week, which is incredible. That's amazing. Congratulations. That's more sightings of echidnas recorded in one year than has been recorded in the past 10 years from just like normal like professional ecological studies or not even like actual ecological studies for echidnas but people have been doing other ecological studies and then have just been like oh sorry echidna in that and we'll, we'll give that to the government right. systems and things like that so that, and you've got the geocoding on those the yeah, pictures of yeah. them so the pictures is like an evidence-based thing because you're using you're getting general public to submit these sorts of um, data for you so as a point of um, data collection data quality at least if you've got a photo there then you can basically evidence like they definitely saw it they're not just giving right, us yeah. data that we can't it's not a picture support. in the museum with the feet backwards yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and we do get those but okay. <laughs> at least I we saw get an echidna at the museum <laughs> in adelaide yeah 
<laughs> Thanks for nothing. <laughs> and we've got um, about 250 scats sent in so wow. far. Wow. So, so 250 times people have found poop, put it in a bag and mailed it to you. Yep, yep. And that's, and that's not even including the ones that um, have they've just they've collected something else. Sure. So because, you know, some people, sometimes like people will just... I was going to ask. Just, I didn't want to ask. Which is like think it's a kidna poo right. and, and give it to us. And there's a few of them, like wombat poo. I don't know if that's a oh, yeah, thing here, but like... Cubes, right? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're squares, so they're very distinguishable. Okay. Um, so we don't get much You've of that. You've got a picture. I, I, I looked through the Echidna CSI website and there yeah. was a picture of all the poos lined up. Yeah. This is wombat, this is wallaby. Yeah. And, and I saw the Echidna and I didn't understand that they were... I thought they were the size of a little hedgehog. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I didn't. Under, I thought, is this to scale, or are they just enlarging this <laughs> to show the detail? But no, it's actually big. Yeah, yeah. they're they're very very large. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's been one of those projects that just it just went nuts. And, and so from your, uh, you know, I know that your research is going to be based on what you're finding in the scats and mm-hmm. what you're uh, putting together from the locations. Are you are you getting just sightings in urban areas where people are, or do people? travel out and about how are you yeah, how are you understanding a, the diff, the the population of people versus the population of echidnas yeah so it's a very common thing with citizen science projects as you you get more things from the more heavily populated areas of, of people right? like because yep. that's you know the nature of the projects so in australia we um most people live sort of on the outside so on the outskirts where there's water and there's you know in the middle is is not a very comfortable right. place to live <laughs> yeah it makes sense <laughs> very very hot and very dry not many not many things out there um, a lot of deadly animals <laughs> lot of deadly probably animals. everywhere but yeah. <laughs> um so we're definitely seeing that sort of distribution when we're getting them more around the edge of australia where more people are living but as the project is going on and as i give more talks and be like Come on, guys, we want something more from the inside. We're, we're seeing it spread further and further into the sit- centre of, of Australia, which has been really, really cool. And we've even gotten um, some scat samples from northern South Australia, which is pretty much smack bang in the middle of Australia. Wow. And they're like like deep red coloured scats because that's the colour of the soil that's out there. And it's really, really so you cool. So you can prove that this came from yeah. somewhere else other than the, the edges of Australia. Yeah, exactly. But um, another interesting thing is that we're actually seeing echidnas popping up in the middle of our cities, which is unusual and probably not great for the echidnas themselves. So even that sort of data is really interesting and really good to have and will probably help us to implement some controls and help with policy making. Yeah, the impact like of that. urbanization on the wildlife population. Yeah. Some, some species will do great and some will exactly yeah not do so great yeah right? yeah absolutely oh, that's, that's wild so so you've got all these people I, I imagine that they're doing it out of the love of science the love of echidnas yep. so there's no chance that if you wanted to do this research that you could get a budget big enough to go no to way. all these places right no, so or even the time the time to travel that much or to it's even a big country yeah yeah, yeah exactly like in comparison to the u.s like australia is is larger than the u.s in, yeah. in total uh it's a really large area to cover there is no way i would physically be able to do it by myself even with a team of scientists there's no way we would be able to collect this many sightings this many scats go to these sorts of locations like the budget alone and the time alone i would be doing this for the next like 40 years of my life if i wanted if i wanted to, to get, get that even sort of a fraction information. of the data yeah. you've gotten in a Year. Absolutely. So that's like the power of citizen science. It's such a cool, cool, cool thing. Well, and the reason you happen to be in Raleigh, North Carolina, halfway around the world today, <laughs> is because you're here for a citizen science conference. Yes. So tell me about that and tell me about some of the things you've you've seen this week. What are the types of projects that really lend themselves to citizen science? Yeah, it's been an incredible conference. So this is uh, the largest citizen science conference in the world, I believe. Um, And it's got over 800 people that came to this conference and they have been from all around the world. There's about six or seven of us from Australia. Um, There's been a lot of people from Europe, even places like South America, Korea, Philippines. It's just, it's been incredible seeing the diversity of people and the diversity of projects coming all in this one center. Mostly focused on wildlife? What are the no, topics? No. Um, so a lot of citizen science is more biodiversity based because, you know, you're getting um, people out into the environment and asking them to take photos of, you know, plants and bugs and lizards and... Birds. The, birds. Oh, birds yeah. is a huge... Is a yeah. huge is it, yeah, there are a lot of birders. I didn't know, I didn't know the world of birding until I started I want to be an science. echidna. I don't know that's a thing, but... <laughs> we should start it. Yeah. yeah. Definitely a thing. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, there's those sorts of projects, but there's also um, what's sort of known as environmental justice, which is a big thing in the US, not so much in Australia, um, where people are taking control of their own environments and doing things like water quality testing, air quality testing, oh, wow. and trying to get things changed in their own communities, in their own environments, um, because they're basically sick of seeing things happen around them and them not having the power to do anything about it. So citizen science has become like this really cool thing that is giving power to the, their own communities and then being involved with researchers and with scientists and with policymakers to then make those changes, which is really cool. But yeah, by going to my stream and sampling it yeah. and, and being able to tell my community you know, when our kids are playing down there in that water, here's what's in it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's yeah. A, a huge service that maybe a university or a government isn't going to be sampling my stream because it's yeah. just not cost effective, but yeah. I could do it. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's heaps of water quality projects out there. Um, there was one I heard about, uh, there was like a truck filled with salt that just sort of tipped over um, right into this area that was getting into a major stream and people were just so angry about it because they tried to contact several agencies several people in government and they were like oh well it's, it it's not my problem go talk to them it's not my problem go talk to them um, and it, it took them like two days to even just clean up the spill which then it, it was already in the waterways and so people were then testing the the salt levels continuously downstream for several months afterwards to actually figure out you know when is it safe again and look what this isn't doing sure, to our the environment impact. Yeah. and it's just it's far water now are the projects do most of them start with a researcher like you or are they starting with the citizens or both how does yeah, it work yeah well, i think traditionally it was sort of more of a researcher had a question that they wanted to answer and um could see the possibility of getting other people involved um so that's more of a, a I guess a, a top-down approach where you've got you know a researcher having a question and getting other people involved, um, but now it's it's sort of more becoming a thing of co-collaborating, uh, co-creative projects where you've got the community members also being involved with the design of the project and what they want to get out of it, their questions, their um, concerns, um, and having researchers um, help them to be able to then run the projects themselves or even just giving them the tools that they can go run it on their own. And yeah, so it's it's becoming a bigger movement now to have the, the actual citizens and community members involved in the entire process, not just in the collection or the, or the an analysis side of things. This feels like a really win, 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 win. So yeah. the scientist is getting valuable data that they could never afford to collect themselves. Yeah the citizens are getting education about how the scientific method works. Mm -hmm. They're getting to participate in it, which is way better than learning about it in a textbook. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And testing things in the environment we're learning about our animal po populations, our insect populations, yep. and we're documenting um, the state of affairs right now. We can understand how it changed. I mean, it's, it's just like... It's, it's good all around. Yeah, and it's forever growing. Um, I know that the NSF here seem to be funding a lot of citizen science projects, which is amazing to see. Um, we don't have quite that amount of support in Australia yet, but um, it's it's still in baby stages, I think, in Australia. Um, citizen science is, um, it's not new, but it's, it's a growing phenomenon. And it's it, getting researchers to even know that this is a resource that they can use and implement and it takes a lot of work it takes a lot of time and energy and you know you're not getting a lot of money for it so people sort of have to be advocates for it for it to become a bigger thing but it's definitely growing um, and I'm so excited to see how it all sort of changes in the future and becomes a bigger and better thing and hopefully you know everyone will be using citizen science in the future and it's coming into our education systems more, um, you're getting schools, um, the teachers implementing citizen science into their classrooms. Um, so go out and take pictures of those bugs that you yeah. find in the playground. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, NCSU is now becoming the um, citizen science campus for undergraduates. They're like, they've got probably hundreds of citizen science projects that undergrads and postgrads can get involved in. And, and they've even got their own um, their own club, like student-run club for citizen science. And it's just to see it being implemented more into higher education too is becoming a really, really cool thing. So are there websites or places that listeners should go, A, to get involved, to be able to take their phone and go participate, mm -hmm. um, or places that they should go to learn about how to do citizen science if their project would support it? Yeah. Where do they go to find out about that? Yeah, well, um, for... 
US, but it's becoming more international as well. Um, SciStarter is sort of the hub of where most like projects... Like Kickstarter for science? Is yeah, it SciStarter? Okay. Yeah, so um, it's... Yeah, it's pretty much where most citizen science projects are listed and you can sign up and they'll send you emails about new projects or they will sort of guide you into particular projects if you've said that you're interested in different areas of research and science. So you can, um, so SciStar is a great uh, place to look for projects. Um, the Citizen Science Association, which is based in the US, but there's um, bunches of different associations now around the globe. So we've got an Australian Citizen Science Association um, and there's a European Citizen Science Association. There's one pretty much... Um, um, on every continent now uh, and they're the places to go if you want to learn more about how you can implement them into your own research they've got resources they've got um, people that you can contact um, there's a new um, journal theories and practice of citizen science that's run through the CSA to be able to see what sort of because yeah, there's a lot of social science research happening now, more about like how are the people involved and what are their motivations behind Makes it. Makes sense, and, yeah. Yeah, so there's, and that's the thing, it can, it can not just be in science now, it's going into social science, it's going into education, it's citizen science is becoming like a global university education system now, which is really, really there's cool. A, there's a new way to practice science yeah. that probably has its own statistical mm-hmm. methods, it probably has its own... I'm, I'm assuming ethics for how you engage yeah, people absolutely. and how you get them to do the work. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and, don't and learning, jump in blind, right? Yeah, yeah. Learning um, how people think and how you can market your research to other people absolutely. to get them involved. How do you make an and, app as a grad student? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a new world. Yeah, exactly. Technology is a huge thing, you know, because we're getting all of this data in. So being able to know how to store the data and where to store the, the data. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, GIS systems involved. And so you've got even like geologists coming in and, you know, figuring out. I all assume that. you store the poop in a freezer. Yes. Okay. I store I saw my poop in a minus 80 degree celsius freezer which i think is 112 fahrenheit so cold very very cold cold, yeah yeah. (laughs) okay Uh, anything else you want to say about citizen science uh no just get get involved like find out more about it um yeah contact your local citizen science association look up all of these cool conferences that are happening all around the world they're amazing and a lot of them are now giving scholarships and um helping out with fees so that just community members can come along as well or teachers and things like that so it's it's just a really great community to be involved in everyone around is so welcoming so nice like this conference has been incredible like you walk into a room and you come out with 10 new friends so yeah it's a fantastic just bunch of people to be involved in as well I love it great advice and and the idea of if, if you know a high school teacher or a middle school teacher mm. letting them know about some of these resources so that they can get their students involved um, I know that funding for science education is not always the best, but there are these resources or yeah. people like you that have put together apps yep. so that kids can get involved, adults can get involved. Absolutely. How much fun would that be for, yeah. Yeah. for a kid to go find an echidna poop? Yeah. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> it would be yeah. the most yeah. fun yeah. for yeah. them. Tell us where, if people want to learn more about Echidna CSI mm-hmm. or they want to get in touch with you, yep. are you on social media? Tell us where to find you on the web. Yeah, I am. So um, my, I'm on Twitter. So my handle is uh, at Talia J. Perry, T-A-H-L-I-A-J. P-E-R-R-Y. Um, it's been really interesting to see how many people spell my name wrong at Starbucks. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> you've probably got every possibility. Yeah. Um, Instagram is Talia underscore Perry. Um, but if you want to follow along for Echidna CSI, we have a website. Just Google Echidna CSI. It's probably easier than me trying to That's fair, read yeah. the... That's <laughs> fair, um, And we also have a Facebook page. If you just want to see cute Echidna photos and videos all day long, um, just follow us on Facebook there- again. There's no if you do want to see cute pictures of echidnas on Facebook. Yeah, and that's it's been an incredible system. Just just seeing the engagement level on things like social media around echidnas has been amazing. Like some of our posts like reach forty to a hundred thousand people sometimes. It's because they're adorable. They're adorable. adorable. People love them, so it's been really really cool. Um, And if you're ever in Australia, download the Echidna CSI app. And if you see an echidna, please post it. (laughs) I'll be the first person that sends you a picture. A echidna from the Raleigh Natural yeah. History Museum. They're like, damn it, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Clean well, this data. <laughs> clean it up, yeah. Well, Talia, thank you so much for taking the time out of the conference. Thank you for flying halfway around the world to talk to us. And we'll look forward to finding out more about uh, where your research leads. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a really, really... I've listened to this podcast. For, like, I literally binge listened to it over the past the six months. The only way to do and it. And I just... Oh, I love it so much. You guys have been giving so much great advice and I just more for everything Hello PhD stands for. Well thanks for reaching out and we will talk to you soon. Thank you.
First of all, Dan, I think it's super cool that Talia reached out to let us know she would be in our backyard in Raleigh, North Carolina, all the way from Australia. That is a helpful reminder to all of you. If you have topics of interest, we want to hear from you. I mean, this was such a, a great opportunity to be able to talk to her while she happens to be in the region. Um, but we also have the technology to call people on Skype. Sure so do. it doesn't we matter sure where do. you are as long as you have the internet. Yeah. So Dan, I, I love the idea of citizen science. Uh, for the last 10 years, I was involved in a lot of K-12 through science outreach programming. So it's something that, that near and dear to my heart. But this is even kind of different than science outreach. This is actually having members of the public help you with your dissertation research. That's pretty cool. Have you gotten to do any, participate in any citizen science projects at all? Uh, the one thing that I have done that I've actually just recently gotten interested in, I really like birds. And so I have the bird feeders in my backyard. You do. And you have like an Audubon Society guide somewhere, don't I you? I know, I know. So, you know, there are these ways you can, uh, they're documenting the migration patterns of, of backyard birds. And so you can basically enter in what birds you observe in your backyard. So that sounds like the eBird project from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And I think that's one of the most famous citizen science projects. They seem to be pretty well funded. And like you said, they're they're tracking bird migrations and populations and threats. It's amazing. One that I participate in as a gardener is called the Big Bug Hunt, where during the summer months when I'm out in the garden more, they will email periodically and say, what bugs have you seen and what were they on? So... I'll be outside, I'll see aphids on a rose, or I'll see squash bugs on my squash plant, and I'll type that in. They are collecting that uh, in the effort to be able to tell people in advance when the a bug group will show up in their area. So if you're a farmer or just even a home gardener, knowing that cabbage moths are on their way is really helpful. Yeah, and that's, it really reminds me a lot of what Talia was talking about is a big advantage to doing citizen science. It's not just... A monetary reason, but it's better data. I mean, your small research team could only be in so many places at one time. And so so much a more accurate snapshot of what's going on in the world when you have all these additional eyes and ears out there collecting data for you. I think the challenge becomes data quality and making, somehow cleaning it up. So you know, on the big bug hunt, I can type in words and it'll have a drop down that says, did you actually mean this? Gnarl so gnarly green bug. Yeah, I'm going to type in the genus and species because that's kind of who I am. But yeah, gnarly green bug is probably an entry that they've gotten a couple thousand times. I would write times. gnarly green bug on the tree leaves. Ew. Just type in ew. <laughs> so, so I think this is, as a citizen scientist, scientist, I think a lot of the challenge is going to be uh, cleaning the data, making sense of it, and making sure that you're getting high quality output from these people that are helping. Well, but you know, Dan, with this bug project, I thought one of the things Talia mentioned, one way they collect data could be super helpful for that too, is folks snap a photograph and most of our devices, there's built in GPS and timestamp info right there in the photo data. No, you're absolutely right. And for an expert who is studying a, a squash bug, they know the, the difference between that and the other 15 bugs that look just like it. So I think you're right. Having that geocoded photo would be really valuable. Yeah, I will say one thing that jumped out at me was the way that people send poop to Talia is very similar to the way our listeners send us beer. Um, except so different. <laughs> no, no, was she she mentioned you act, you asked her if it was legal to send <laughs> send biological waste through the mail, and she said, "Well." The mail carriers it's don't soil. know that's You're sending what's soil to the mail. It's fine. <laughs> that is literally how sending beer to us works. Is it? Is it legal? It's water. Yeah. It's technically just water. Um, but thanks, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other thing I thought was really I got a chuckle out of was the we have discussed weights and measures and units on the show, and I enjoyed your discussion of of Smurfs are three apples high. I, I put a picture of an echidna <laughs> in our in our show notes here. Two basketballs. Did, did you scroll up and and can you tell me from the photo how big you think it is? Isn't there's no oh, telling? Oh, I would I would have said that is about the size of one volleyball. But it's two bas two basketballs. I don't know. That's it big. doesn't look like uh, two, you, two basketballs is pretty tall. I mean, I would not have thought it was that big. You can't tell. There's no banana next to it. That's the problem. <laughs> Do you think these creatures are cute or not? They're kind of weird yes. looking. Yeah, I think they're adorable. Yeah, uh, they pass the squee test. <laughs> what is this, a squee test? Well, when you see one, you go, squee. Oh, I want to see its feet backwards. All pictures from the front. Oh, look at that. Skeleton is totally wrong. Skeleton's wrong. Foot's feet facing are, forward. Feet are facing the wrong way. Oh, here you go. Here you go. Right here. See it? Oh, yeah. Can you tell? Backwards. Foot's backwards. Well, some citizen science going on here today. 
<laughs> uh, I'm going to send Talia we'll get back a photo to you in a couple that I of found weeks. online. You know, Dan, actually, the citizen science thing, I thought the example she gave of the of the neighborhood where the salt truck um, had the accident and truly you know, citizen-driven Yeah, science. I mean, the officials said, you know, we don't have the, the manpower, we don't care enough to go check this out. You know, I think that's a similar thing to what, what happened here in the United States with the Flint water crisis, the lead levels in Flint, Michigan, the sort of initial bellwether that I believe were some some citizens who were testing water uh, for their own purposes, I think through me through a class or something, and they first discovered this. Yeah, and that was that was what I heard from her and, and by looking through yeah. the conference. It's a lot of middle school and high school students are coming to this conference and they're participating in their own schoolyard or they're participating in their local habitat areas. Awesome, awesome way of getting people interested in science by getting their hands on it. Well, and really that's what, you know, that's what science at its core is all about. It's understanding how the world around us works. And I think sometimes we lose sight of what that means. And we think, especially I think sometimes those of us who have been in the science machine for long enough, as we think these questions have to be these huge global questions, but really how inherently interesting is it to just understand, no, like really how do things work right outside my window? I mean, how cool is it? There was a whole, there was a whole conference about this with people all over the world, right here in our backyard. Amazing. It was totally amazing. I wish I would have gone. You should have. <laughs> how did I miss this? Josh, I would love to hear from some of our listeners who may be participating in citizen science, their projects. Maybe they've started an app or they have a website or some way that they've got the general population helping them. I would love to hear the other examples of that. Or maybe they're thinking about it and there's a way that they could put this together. We could put them in touch with Talia or other people in that community and start leveraging the power of the rest of us. And it sounds like people want to do this. I know I do. I do too. Dan, can you think of any ways you could have leveraged citizen science in your own project in grad school? Everybody takes a mouse home. <laughs> no? It'd be tough. I think it'd be pretty tough. Everything was in dishes and uh, incubators and PCR machines. Everyone everyone donned this respirator and Tyvek suit. Your home needs to be uh, BSL-4. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> home BSL-4 Any, Anybody kit. who has a home BSL-4, actually, we probably would like to know who you are. <laughs> and we will alert the, the uh, proper the authority. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and just to be totally clear, it was a BSL-3, not a oh, BSL-4. Okay, yeah. fine. Yeah. All right, Dan. Well, thanks for doing that interview. That was really fascinating. Thanks to Talia for reaching out to us, first of all, and for taking the time to talk to us. Absolutely. And uh, my conversation with her sparked another interest that we have, another uh, question that we'd like to ask our listeners. I asked her about how grad school is different in Australia, um, having been through the process now that she's in the middle of the process. And uh, I've got an interview recorded with her about the ways that that Australia experience is different. We'd also like to hear from people from around the world. Uh, If you listen to Hello PhD podcast, you've heard how a lot of Graduate programs work in the United States, but we'd love to hear about your country. And what I took from my interview with Talia that we will include in this future episode is there are some great ideas that are worth considering for graduate school here in the U.S. and other places. We do not have it all figured out. If there's anything, this show illuminates. You mean you and me or like the U.S. program in general? Yeah. Well, probably both. Yeah, fair enough. And I think, Dan, we're going to go ahead and and make the audio of that conversation you had with Talia about grad school in Australia available to our Patreon. Yeah, I I would like to do that. We have uh, patrons from all over the world. So we will put that interview together just for you guys. Uh, You'll get it earlier than everybody else. And then uh, we'd like to hear from you about your experience in different parts of the world. And also, we would love to hear from you if you have a question or a topic idea you'd like to hear on the show. You can email us, podcast at hellophd.com, send us a tweet at hellophd, or leave us a message on our Facebook page. If you like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We love the feedback. If you'd like to support the show, you can become a patron. Simply go to our website, hellophd.com, and click the Become a Patron button. Or you can visit patreon.com slash hellophd. We would appreciate the beer money. Thanks to the ongoing support from all our patrons. And thanks to Adrian for sending us this beer today. For converting you to sour beers. I never thought or it was going to happen. a sour beer. Let's not go too yeah, far. Yeah, that's not beers plural. It is a sour beer. Uh, he did send a second sour beer, so maybe we'll try that one uh, in a future episode. We could, have a, we could have a winning streak. We could have sour beer summer. 
I don't think he would stay with the show. <laughs> we'll see. And in other news, we're going to go on a break for summer. <laughs> we'll see you in the fall. Uh, that's not true, but Dan, I will see you uh, next time. We'll for see next you next time. time. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode... El- God. <laughs> 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 three ones in uh, 111. Ones. Let's do it again.